Turn our attention to, to God's Word. On Sundays, if you attend here, you'll find that I have a lot of slides. The, the guys and girls in the back know that. <laughs> and I try to put every scripture reference that I use during the sermons on the overhead so anybody can follow along. But since this is Wednesday, and only really serious disciples of Jesus come to church on Wednesday, I thought it would be helpful for us to actually use our Bibles. So if you have a Bible, you brought it, if you have your phone, you have an app, or if you don't have one, we got a stack of them on the back table. Go ahead and grab a Bible. I am going to read kind of slowly and carefully, but I'd love for us to have some paper in our hand. If you don't mind doing that, I would greatly appreciate it, and it'll help you to see what it is that we're studying together. The, uh, the topic of this little sermon series we're doing is called The Power of Now. Somebody say The Power of Now. Power of now. Oh, more than one person. Great. Good, good job. You guys sound good. Uh, the Power of Now. The idea behind this sermon series is we're talking about living in the moment. In fact, I had subtitled the series in my early preparation, The Power of Now, Living in the Moment. And I backed out of that because it's easy to live in the moment with no reference to God. Uh, you can be a total hedonist who's right in the moment experiencing whatever you're experiencing, only caring about right now, not planning for the future, not having learned from the past, no reference to others, and just loving the moment. It's a very carefree existence. That's not exactly what the scripture has in mind. And so I changed the subtitle from, from living in the moment to the life transforming practice of knowing God in the present. Now that's overly long and cumbersome, I recognize. But it's the life transforming practice of knowing God in the present. And it's life transforming because when you live in the past anchored to hurt or regrets, you can constantly in the present be experiencing pain and hurt that God doesn't want you to experience. And so living in the past changes your present. If you live, as we're gonna talk about tonight, in the future, in an unknown future with either a positive or negative look, you could be missing out on what God has for you that's right in front of you. And so this, this practice of knowing God in the present really is life transforming. And we are seeing how this kind of develops in Psalm 118. So if you've been following along, you may already have your Bible open there. Uh, if not, Psalm 118 this is the last of a little section of psalms that's actually music. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. If you ever read song lyrics, they don't, they're not immediately obvious the meaning. There's repetition, and then there's, there's rhyme, and sometimes there's uh, allegory, and you have to think about what it is you're reading because this, this is, in fact, music. This psalm is one of four psalms that historically uh, Jews sang out loud together during the Seder meal, the Passover meal. So every year they would eat this meal full of significance and substance, celebrating God's deliverance from oppression in Egypt, God as the deliverer and savior, looking forward to how God would ultimately save his people through the death of a spotless lamb, all of this imagery, and then at the end of their meal they would sing. And in fact, we see in the Gospels that when Jesus, our savior, celebrated Passover with his disciples, it says they sang a hymn, and it was likely Psalm 118 was one of the songs that they sang. Isn't that cool? And so we've been looking at different sections of it. We started with uh, the present, and then last week we looked at the past. Today we're going to look at the future. <clears throat> so let's read Psalm 118. We'll overlap a few verses. I'll start in verse 14, and we'll read through uh, 24, and then we'll jump in. Here's what it says. Psalm 118, starting in verse 14. The Lord is present tense, is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Notice the present verb. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. We read that last week, and now, verse 17, the psalmist looks to the future. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Recount or remember. That was the focus from last week. Here he's focusing on what the future will look like. He's recognizing that God is the source of his life, and so he uses the analogy of life and death to talk about a positive future, to sing about a positive future and a rescue from death itself. Verse 18, the Lord has disciplined me severely, but has not given me over to death. Things were not great for the psalmist. 
This was not necessarily a super happy song. He was remembering hard things, and all of us have gone through hard things. Sometimes God's very much involved in those hard things you go through, but he never puts us through hard things without purpose, and that purpose always entails our good, our safety, and our deliverance. Verse 19 Here he looks to the future again and cries out to God who he knows is for him. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. We'll talk a little bit about what that means in a minute. This is the gate of the Lord. What? Where? Where is it? The righteous shall enter through it. Verse 21. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. This will be a familiar verse, verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then this section concludes with verse 24, which is bringing us back to the present. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, wouldn't you love to know the secret of being able to rejoice and be glad in every day? How many of you have had some days where you weren't rejoicing or being glad? Like this week, right? Exactly, yeah. We, not every day, circumstantially, allows us to rejoice and be glad. The secret to rejoicing and being glad when we have bad days is recognizing that this day came from the Lord and living in reference to him. I went surfing today at lunch. I, l- I work from my house several days a week. I uh, live very close to the beach, and when the waves are good, I will, I will head out at lunchtime and surf for half an hour, 45 minutes. I love it. It's a great way to spend your lunch hour. If you can do that, I strongly recommend that you do. So I surf. I live a few blocks from the Main Street Pier in Daytona, and there's like three or four turns you have to take to get there. And so I try to walk different routes because I'm trying to meet everyone that lives between my house and where I surf. So I'm always looking to meet people. Now there's this big church on the corner of Grandview and uh, Harvey. It's the uh, the Community Methodist Church. It's a huge historic church, and they do a lot of programs, feeding programs, clothing programs. There's a lot of low-income and homeless people that are there. Uh, they have access to the Internet. They do a lot of really charitable work. And so I was walking by there today, and there was a long line of people sitting and waiting for those services. And so I'm walking by this long line of people uh, with my surfboard. And one of them said to me, you going surfing? <laughs> right? So I love talking to people, so I stopped my walk and started talking to them. And I said, yeah, I'm going surfing. What are you doing? And they said, well, I'm here to, you know, have this service, that service. And I said, oh, wow, do you, um, do you go to church here? She said, no, I don't believe in God. I was like, oh, so these people believe in God, and you see what they're doing because of that, and you're benefiting from that, but you don't believe in God. She's like, no. It's like, so what they're doing doesn't in any way make you believe in God. No. So I was like, okay, all right. Well, have a nice day. I started walking away, and she goes, hey, aren't you afraid of sharks? And I said, I don't believe in sharks. <laughs> and I just kept on walking. So uh, uh, on the way back, I walked the same route, hoping that I would see some of those same people. Sure enough, they're all sitting there waiting. So I walk by, and the same lady says to me, did you see any sharks? And I said, nope, only fins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> only fins. You know, it's, it, it blows my mind that, that people can continue to live in a world without reference to God, with so much evidence that he exists. Now, I know that there, is, there are serious challenges to the existence of a good God, because there's a lot of evil in the world, a lot of bad things that happen. But just because there's difficulty in the world, bad things happen, people get hurt, that does not mean that God doesn't exist. And so for people who decide to live outside of the reference of the existence of God, they're missing something that is powerful and beautiful and wonderful. And that comes in the form of the salvation of God from difficulty, the deliverance of God from a struggle, and the presence of God to help you through whatever you are going through. What I want to talk to you about tonight is our tendency to live in the future. So we started the series talking about getting into the moment, recognizing that's where God exists. 
Last week we talked about being set free from being anchored in the past, whether that was the form of regret because of something you did or resentment, something that happened to you. But so many of us have a, a tendency to live in the future. And I have found that the older I get, the less I, I can live in the future and the more I live in the past. When I was very young, I only ever thought about the future. The past was gone, and I only thought about what was going to happen in front of me. I'm 35 this year. I'll be 36. And now I'm like, I'm, the, I'm kind of the tipping point now. I'm like, I'm passing halfway to 70, right? So I'm going over, I'm going over 36. And so we, we, we have this tendency to live in, in reference to, to the future. I also find that there tends to be kind of two generic personality types, the pessimist and the optimist, Right? So the, the classic optimist poem, which I'm an optimist, so I memorized this little four-line poem. You can, you can memorize it, too, if you want to. Here's the, here's the poem. The optimist fell ten stories, but at every window bar, yelled to his friends inside, all right so far. <laughs> right? Yeah, so always focus on the positive. Then, of course, there's a lot of people that see that as being silly, foolish, and naive. How many of those people? They, they call themselves realists. We call them pessimists, right? I'm a realist. I remember this story about this, uh, this guy gets a new hunting dog, and so he reaches out to his realist friend to take him hunting because he wants to show him how great this dog is. The dog's name is Jesus. So he takes uh, Jesus and his buddy out, and they go, they go hunting, and uh, he, he shoots a bird, shoots a duck. The duck comes down. And he says, go get it, Jesus. And so Jesus runs out on top of the water and grabs the duck and then runs back on the water. Right? Pretty amazing. So he looks at his pessimistic friend to see what he thinks about that. Guy has just a sour look on his face. And he said, she said, what, you don't have anything positive to say about my dog? Isn't that amazing? He goes, yeah, he can't swim a lick. Right? <laughs> so I know that's silly, but all of us tend to have a disposition as we look into the future, that's either negative or positive. Our negative people at best become the risk management specialists. They think of everything that can go wrong, take preparation, and they're ready in case of a disaster. Raise your hand if that's you. Come on, be bold. That's all right. And the rest of us are like, it'll be fine. How many of you say it'll be fine like 12 times a day? Oh, wow, all right. I've got some like-minded people. I'm one of those people. The downside to being an optimist fixated on the future is that things aren't always fine, are they? We tend to be easily disillusioned and disappointed. What? How could this person have not done the thing they said they were going to do, which I made all my plans around? How could this be? Because everybody does what they say they're going to do. And all the realists go, no, 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 no. You should have called. You should have confirmed. You should have had a backup plan, right? So it's easy for us to live in the future. Now, for those of us who live in the future with a realistic or pessimistic view on things, our tendency is going to be towards one of three W words that I'm going to leave you with tonight. The first of which is worry. Somebody say worry. Worry. Worry, anxiety, stress, fear, all of these words, as we look into an unknown future, we tend to get an uneasy, stressed out, hearts beating, as you think about the details, uh, generally uncomfortable and, and a worrisome approach to life. And one of the wonderful things about the scripture is it always, in many different ways, is giving us a present walk with the God who created everything and who is disposed towards you in love and who is offering you salvation and forgiveness and redemption and renewing and repurposing. He's calling you into a relationship and the... the effect of that relationship, of knowing God in the present, is the elimination of worry. And it doesn't mean we know the future. It doesn't mean we know what the future will hold. It just means we have every confidence in the one who holds the future. Amen? And so we see that again and again in Scripture. And so some of you here, 11, 12 years old, others older than that, and as you look towards an unknown future, what are the things that you are hoping for or sad because they haven't changed? Some of us are single and would like to be married. Some of us are married and wish when we were still single. Uh, some of us don't look at the person you're with tonight, right? <laughs> Some of us are wondering about career choices. Uh, what kind of education path should I take? The whole world seems like a, a bunch of open options. Th there's there's a, a 
should I should I move to this new state? Should I take this different job? Should I start a relationship? Should I go to a group? Should I break something off? And as you look at all of these possible decisions that you can make, you become kind of overwhelmed by anxiety. And there's lots of ways we deal with anxiety, whether it's the small ways of kind of burying our head in the sand and staying home and, and becoming a hermit or dealing with those with um, prescription medication or otherwise. Uh, different things we can do to kind of numb ourselves, to distract ourselves, mask the worry, but unless we deal with it, every time we look at the future, which becomes often, the more worried about things you get, the more you pay attention, the little news comes up on your phone, we're seeing all this stuff about Iran and North Korea, every day on my phone's popping up, oh, CNN, there it is, right there on my phone right now. Uh, Donald Trump tweeted something, everyone's freaking out, oh, what does it mean? And so we can get this general sense of, of kind of sweaty, worried anxiety and, and, a, and an unknown future that will it go well for us or, or not. And the scriptures speak directly to that. If you have your Bible, flip over to, in the New Testament to the book of Philippians. Philippians. So if you're, in the, if you're in the New Testament, if you get to the point where the Old Testament ends, the New Testament begins, there's a couple white pages in there, blank pages. And then you get the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you get the book of Acts, which is the Acts of the Apostles. It's the follow-up to Luke's Gospel. And then you get the two letters to the Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians. And then you get Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, or God's Electric Power Company, G-E-P-C. So Philippians. So if you get to Philippians, and you get to chapter 4, you'll find verse 6, which is a famous verse. May, many of you know it in its simplified version from the NIV. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. That's the way we teach it to our kids. Don't worry about anything. It's easy to teach that to kids. You know why? They don't worry about anything. That's one of the wonderful things about being a kid. You generally worry very little. Now, I know some of you were natural-born worriers. You're, you've been worrying since you looked at your parents as a three-year-old. You're like, I'm not sure that's a good idea, Mom, you know? So there are definitely natural worriers, but for the most part, the younger you are, the less you worry, and that's because you don't know a lot of stuff, and there's these responsible adults in your life that tend to take care of everything. And God says, that's how you should feel about me as an adult. He reveals himself to us primarily as the Father. The one who created us, made us, loves us, wants good things for us, and knows what's going to happen. He's wise, he's been around forever, and if you'll trust him and do the things he says, you can live a worry-free life. And so the command to people who tend to worry is, don't worry, instead, replace that worry where your brain starts working on all these possible outcomes, most of which are scary, turn that mental process into a conversation with the only person that can do anything about it. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. He already knows, but he wants to hear it from you. And then thank him for all he has done. You're recognizing the presence and that active movement of God in your own life. That builds your own faith. It draws you into an experience of him. And it allows you to participate in God reshaping the future for your benefit. Isn't that amazing? And then he goes on. He actually says in verse 8, finally, brothers, he goes, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, all amazing words, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. He goes, look for where God's at work, where all the good stuff exists, and put your mind focused on those things. So pray to God, talk to him, tell him the things you need, and now focus on all of the good that is there. And what you find is it dissolves worry. But it's not a magic trick. It's because you are walking with God in the present. It is a life-transforming experience, but it comes as you connect to God in the moment. And what happens is the worry about the future, which is not there yet, it, it, it dissolves away and you are allowed to experience the present and all the good God has for you in it. In your relationship with him, in your interaction with other people, in the beauty of creation all around you that you may have otherwise not even noticed because our eyes get so fixed on all the things that could go wrong, we can't enjoy all the things that are good right here and right now. Amen? So that's, so that's worry. The second, the second W word 
is, uh, it's actually a phrase, wishful thinking. Somebody say wishful thinking. All right, so time for confession. So this is totally me. I'm a natural born optimist. I think everything's going to be fine. Even like we have four kids, our youngest son, Julian, he's, he's, not, he's nine months and change old. He's at that stage where he's not nursing anymore and we're trying to teach him to eat solid food. He's always had like a very strong gag reflex. Like he went from drinking milk and we gave him like, you know, dissolved apples and prunes, super smooth, and it was like too much for him. And so my wife, she's, she's the more uh, pessimistic, realistic worrier. So we, we pair up really good. We really do. We complement each other really well. So he starts to gag, and she goes, honey, honey, honey. She'll get him out of the seat, turn him over and everything. And I'm just like, give him a minute, right? Let's just see how he does with this. Right now he's chewing with his throat. That's uncomfortable, but he's got to learn, right? So you have these experiences where you start, now we're giving him like little chunks of egg and, and different stuff. We get, we're in a restaurant the other night, and I'm, I'm spoon feeding him rice. I'm like, what's he going to do with rice? How's that going to do? Oh, get him out, get him out. No, 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 let's see what he does. Let's wait. And I'm always like, it'll be fine, which is great until it's not fine, right? At some point you go, oh, he can't breathe at all. Not that, uh, get him out. And uh, you start, it's really important that we don't live in a world that is better than reality, right? That's, that's wishful thinking. It's actually a lot more fun, honestly, I got to tell you. It's pretty nice thinking everything's going to be fine. Because most of the time, when everything is fine, you just get to experience the lightness and joy of, ah. Oh. But man, you are not ready when things go bad, are you, at all? Boo! I mean, stuff hits you upside the head like a two-by-four. What is happening? I, and then you hear, I told you. I told you so, right? If you have one of those awesome realists in your life, I told you. And so it's easy for us to get, to get into this, this uh, wrong way of thinking positively about the future. There's a, there's a hopeful, positive uh, element there which can uh, seem more appealing, but then at the same time, you are a person who is somewhat naive, easily duped maybe, and ripe for disillusionment because the world is not fine. We always think, I'm always the guy that thinks everything will go as good as it can possibly go. So you take on a, a, a project and you're going to make money and then you end up not making any money or things are going to all happen in this timeline and then they don't. And I was sharing with you the story about our, my, my surfing trip to Costa Rica that sprung on me generously at the last minute and I was so excited and we're walking into the airport for our first flight after getting our, our original flights got canceled because they were going through Houston. There was a little hurricane called Harvey happening. So we lost our flights. We were able to get new ones. It worked out. We were so excited. We get to the airport. They check our surfboards and don't charge us anything, which never happens. We, like, walked away like, yeah right? And then we get to the gate, and they give us expedited service into the gate, and we're like, all right, we don't have to wait in line, and we got time for breakfast, and we're having a coffee, and we're sitting there, and we got uh, exit rows at no extra charge. We're like, this is amazing. All this stuff is falling in. It's all being fine. And then they told us, your flight is three hours delayed, and now you're going to miss your once-a-day flight connection in Fort Lauderdale, and your five-day surf trip is now turning into a three-day surf trip. And you get to stay without your family in beautiful Fort Lauderdale near the airport, <laughs> right? It wasn't fine. And here I am like, oh, no, 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 no. Everything was going so well. How is it not going well now? So I'm thinking, oh, you know what? I'll bet the second flight will be delayed too. And so we'll just get there and hop on a late flight. Everything's going to work out just fine. It wasn't fine. <laughs> we slept in an airport hotel and missed a whole day of surfing. In fact, the best day of surfing. And so here I am having this, like, kind of freak out internally because things didn't go as well as I thought they would go. And so wishful thinking, while for the most time, most part, is a nicer way of experiencing the world, as far as I'm concerned. Some of you are like, mm -mm, not for me, no thank you. But people let us down. Things don't go the way we hoped they would go. Everything does not work out. And there is an answer for this as well. Flip over to James. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. I'll open up in the, the big one here. James chapter 4, near the end. The apostle James is writing to a church, telling them how to think about the future. And this idea of this presumption and this wishful thinking kind of permeates the way they expect God to do everything fine, perfectly, every single time, or that they even continue 
to act without reference to him. Chapter 4 of James, in verse 13, it says, <clears throat> Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Generally positive about the outcome of certain plans and moving forward with or without reference to God. Verse 14, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. You notice the disposition change? Immediately the reference point becomes God, not our plans, not our perspective on an unknown future, positive as it may seem to us, if the Lord wills. And so we have this immediate uh, sub- self-subjecting of ourselves to God. What, is, what does he want? What does he, what does he want for us in this moment? What is next? Not, not a, a rosy future, but what does God want to know that he's the author of it? And then to recognize that he is the source of our very life. He's the one that preserves us from the evil that could befall us. He's the one that carries us through the difficult circumstances. He is the one that brought us into this world. And like our parents tell us, he can take us out, right? And if we live in reference to him, recognizing he's the source, it changes us from having a worrisome approach to life or a naive, wishful thinking about the future. So what's the third expression and third W word? It's wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. Wisdom. Uh, We tend to think differently about wisdom. As I talk to people about wisdom, a lot of people get different ideas about what it is. I I have found from, from life experience and understanding the scriptures that there are generally four different kinds of wisdom, and when I hear someone say the word, I kind of lean in to try to discern which one of those ones are they talking about. There's one of the first four is uh, universal wisdom, a general sense of how the world works that comes from experience, kind of a, a whole broad way of thinking and way of living that is generally true for everyone. Like, it's better to save money than to spend everything you have. Does that wisdom? Anybody here that have world, real world experience say, having some money saved is better than having none, right? So if you have wishful thinking, you can go swipe and we'll figure it out later. Because the world's going to be better, I'm going to get a raise, everything's going to be fine, we'll figure it out, right? Wisdom would say, hmm, not so fast, right? I'm going to live on 100% of everything that I make, every single penny I'm going to spend. But what if something bad happens, says the realist in the room? That's not wisdom. So there's this kind of universal wisdom that is kind of generally accessible and knowable by everyone. You can access it in all sorts of points. The scripture's filled with it, but you can read it in magazines and in books and, and, and all over the place. It's accessible. There's this universal wisdom. And that's because God designed the world to work in certain ways. And not all things have immediate consequences. And so there is this universal general wisdom that all humans have access to and most of us gain through personal experience. That's why we say, I guess I'm just one of those people that has to learn the hard way, right? Universal wisdom. The second one we see in the scripture is this idea of a word of wisdom or an utterance of wisdom. This is a spiritual gift that's the supernatural activity of God where there are two futures available for you or several. You don't know which one is the right one, the best one, the one that God has designed for you and wants you to walk into. You have no idea. Universal wisdom does not provide any further clarity. And so God, by his spirit, gives this word or utterance of wisdom about what you should do. And God does that all the time. Some people experience this in themselves for themselves. They use words like peace. I had a peace about it. I had a sense that this was the right thing to do. Uh, Lots of people experience this, but it also can come through someone else that can say, hey, I I feel like God's kind of showing me or speaking to me something for you, and maybe this is wisdom for you. And so there can be this kind of of out-of-left-field, supernatural infusion of wisdom that the Bible calls a word of wisdom. There's also what I call the wisdom from humility. So part of wisdom is knowing what's the, the next right thing to do, isn't it? In a, in a world full of options, whether we think terrible thoughts about all the bad things that could happen and we take all the steps to protect ourselves, or we, we wander dangerously into a future we think will be fine to our own detriment, there is, there is a right set of steps. 
And so this is what wisdom is. And there's a wisdom that just comes from humility, of just knowing who you are. And so one of the reasons I share with you who I am is because I've learned that I make the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. And so if I can get into my own head and recognize what what are the things that I continually do wrong and recognize that, well, I can start to make better decisions because I I'm, I'm honest about who I am, who I've been, the things that I tend to do, whether they're good things or bad things. And so there's a wisdom that comes from knowing yourself. One of the challenges we face, especially in church, is that we oftentimes try to apply that universal wisdom to everyone the same way. And we're all very different people, aren't we? Sometimes God's wired you to go off and do something that seems unconventional. And it's the right thing for you to do. And he knows it, and he wants you to know it, but not everybody else is going to get it. And so we can't, we can't just tell everyone, I don't know that that's wise. That doesn't seem wise. There is this general universal wisdom that we can all benefit from, but part of knowing what's the right thing for you to do next requires that you're walking in an intimate relationship with God, that you're being honest before him, that you're being sub- submitted to him, willing to be corrected by him, walking in the fear of the Lord, under the scrutiny of the scriptures, and you go, I want to benefit from God's view on the future. And so I have this disposition of knowing myself and then trying to make good decisions decisions for me. It's not a good decision for me to whatever. I don't know what it is that God's trying to change in your life. I don't know what it is that uh, is the first step towards lots of wrong choices. You could know. God certainly knows. And the closer you're walking with him, the more clarity you will have in humility about what is the best choice for you. And then lastly, There's this wisdom that comes from experience. It's funny, we can have people that know a lot and tell us the same thing, but man, nothing teaches you wisdom like bad decisions, right? I mentioned uh, last week when I was talking about uh, regret that I I bought a house in 2006, which if, if you're an adult and you were paying attention, you know that was the worst possible time that you could have bought real estate. So we bought a house, 800 square feet, two bedrooms and one bathroom, the cheapest house in all of Volusia County for $148,900, which was the max we were able to finance because I made very, very little money at the time. So we went into a house at the top of a bubble, borrowed all the money we could possibly afford and then anyone would loan us, and within 18 months, our house was valued at $53,000. So a lot of people were like, I was upside down. I wasn't even upside down. I was looking at the ground. I was in a hole in a hole. That's where I was at, right? So nothing teaches you about making those kind of decisions like that experience, right? No one one could have told me that. Maybe someone tried, but I had big eyes for owning a house. And so experience is a great teacher, And there comes a wisdom just from living. This is part of the reason why the first commandment of the Ten Commandment that has to do with human relationships is children, obey your parents. Because they've been doing this a lot longer than you, and they care about your well-being. So you're going to benefit from just doing what they say. This is why we wanted the youth in here for this series, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is super helpful. Uh, for the most part, just, just honoring your parents, recognizing no one's going to love you the way they do, and they know a whole lot of things that you don't know, and so do what they say. And, and it comes from this idea of God's heart for us to experience wisdom. I think all of us would recognize that there's a need for wisdom. It doesn't matter how old you are, there's always an uncertain future, and there's always options in front of us. We have uh, we're a mix of, of competing desires in our own heart. And so I tend to live my life looking into the future and going, well, I could go down this path and that would have these positives and these negatives. And I could go down this path entirely different and that would give me this blessing and I'd escape this future. And, or I could do this entirely different thing. And, and so the world is like a myriad of options. Anybody feel this way? I mean, sometimes we feel very stuck, but even then we go, I could just back out of the whole thing, right? And so here we have a a moment, a present experience where our feelings and thoughts about an unknown future can drive us to fear, anxiety, stress, and worry, or we want to just be 
positive and naive about everything's gonna work out, everything will be fine. Ultimately, what God calls us to is to walk with him in the present, and he says he will provide wisdom for each next step. That's his promise. We look back to James uh, chapter 1 and verse 5. It's a powerful passage. I'd suggest all of you familiarize yourself with it. It's very short. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, here's that, here's that drive back to a relationship with God, the presence of God, prayer. If any of you lacks wisdom, James 1 verse 5, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. And here's the promise, and it will be given him. Isn't that that an amazing promise? And so if we can live with God in the moment, not only do we have our worries dissolved, are we saved from a rosy outlook that ultimately could end up slapping us like a two by four with reality, and we have this We have this intimate experience of God in the moment, and he says, I will tell you what the next thing to do is. He doesn't tell us what all the next steps are, but he gives us the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And he goes, live right here in the moment. Be set free from worry. Be delivered from wishful thinking. If you lack the wisdom to make the next step, go to God and ask him. And he is the God who gives generously to all without reproach. And you can expect to receive the wisdom that God will give you. Isn't that great news? The, the, um, the credit score, God's credit score, it's perfect. You guys, have you ever pulled your credit score? I know if you're 12, you haven't pulled your credit score. Your parents will talk to you about that. God has a perfect credit score, and it will never change. He's 100% reliable to do what he said he will do, and, and that is actually found in Psalm 118. I don't know if you know this or not. We, we went over it quickly, but I'll, I'll end here. Psalm 118, verse 21 I thank you, here the psalmist is talking to God, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. God did act on his benefit on his behalf. And in verse 22, this is an enigmatic pair of sentences. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. One of the things about walking with God you will find is he does things you never expected, never could have prepared for, never saw coming. He delivers you from certain calamity. Your enemies are against you strongly. There's no way out. And God does something to remove them completely. What? God did it. And it's marvelous in our eyes. You are facing perfect need with no help, no income, no promise, no possibility, and a check ends up in your mailbox. See, God, God is outside of the box, and when he acts, we all go, what? And this is why he drives us to him in prayer. He wants us to be continually having his experience of being able to enjoy the moment because we're knowing the God who does marvelous things for his people. And The credit score, the trustworthiness of God is found in verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now there is a large and long biblical historical setup to understand this. This ultimately is fulfilled in the death, the betrayal, and execution of Jesus, the Messiah. He is the cornerstone. Now we don't build like this anymore. Here's a picture. The big block there, that's the cornerstone. We, we now build on foundations, so monolithic foundations or um, diff- different ways of building. But this is the way this is done historically. You'd find a very large stone that would not crack or shear, and that stone would be planed out perfectly, nice and straight, sure and true. And then that would be placed perfectly so that it could be built off of in every direction without any more leveling. So you get that, that one cornerstone set properly, and it's, it's lined up on your property, your lines. Everything's, you twist it a little this way, everything's wrong. You twist it a little this way, everything's wrong. Once it's set and straight, now you can just keep building and building and building and building and building. And, and because that cornerstone was where you started, and because it's tried and true and sure, everything you build on that will then be straight and trustworthy and, and square. This is the idea of a cornerstone. Now there's a theme in Scripture about a stone, and I, we don't have time to get into it all tonight, but there's always been this expectation 
expectation that there would be this person who would represent God's people and be the stone, be the one who would kind of provide the direction and provide the stability and be the anchor. And ultimately, brothers and sisters, we find in the Gospels a a reference to this verse saying this is Jesus. And he was rejected by men. The people who are the builders, who are the ones who are meant to be establishing the purpose of God through the people of God, looking for that cornerstone by which everyone could anchor themselves, straighten themselves, align to, and live in reference to, looking for that stone. They didn't find it and use it. They tripped over it, and it shattered them. That's the imagery we see in the scriptures. Now that's scary, isn't it? And so here tonight, all of us are being offered two experiences. One in which we look to God's provision of Jesus. Completely perfect, completely reliable, fixed in time, and done. It is finished. And he invites us to set the stone of our life in reference to him. He says this is true north, so we say it's true north. I'm not trying to figure out everything. I am referencing my life, aligning my life, building my life in accordance with the cornerstone. And if you do that, you will experience the salvation, the deliverance, the blessing of knowing God in the moment and will transform the way you experience the world. And if you go, nah, not for me. I'm gonna go my own direction. What happens is, uh, you fall over it and eventually its weight crushes you. Now, those are two options that are very easy to tell what's the best one. Amen? So my invitation to you, and the scripture's invitation, is that you would build your life on that cornerstone. The stone that was rejected by men, because of that rejection, Christ has become the substitution for us, the savior for for us, our leader, our Lord, our savior, and so now, We have a risen Christ who is in heaven, who we can know in the moment, filled with his spirit, have our present transformed as we don't look to the future, whether it's pessimistically or optimistically, but instead we bring ourselves into the moment in prayer to him, receiving wisdom for each next step and just doing what he tells us to do. And that's the Christian life. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. It's to go, okay, God, I'm right here with you in this moment and I'm just gonna do the next thing you tell me to do, and the next thing you tell me to do, and sometimes it won't make any sense to anyone, but it's gonna be marvelous in our eyes. Amen? One of the things that will happen when you do this is it will transform the present for you. I'm gonna gonna close with this story. This is from a, a book by Greg Boyd called Present Perfect. It's about finding God in the now, very similar theme to what we've been talking about. Here's what it says. To this day, the play Our Town remains my favorite. The action takes place in a small town at the turn of the 20th century. In the play's final act, a young girl named Emily dies giving birth, and she finds herself in the graveyard hanging out with other people from the town who had died before her. There she learns that she's allowed to relive any day of her life she chooses, though the others advise her not to. She'll find it painful, they say, because the living don't understand. Emily, nevertheless, insists and chooses to relive her 12th birthday. Her 12th birthday. Initially, Emily is overwhelmed by the beauty of everything she sees. I love you all, everything. I I can't look at anything hard enough, she exclaims. But she is saddened as she quickly realizes that the living don't see what she sees. Everyone is too caught up in the busyness of their life to really look at one another. In frustration, Emily cries out to her mother at one point, Oh, Mama, just look at me one minute as though you really saw me. Mama, 14 years have gone by. Just for a moment, now we're all together. Mama, just for a moment, we're happy. Let's look at one another. Sadly, her mother is too busy to hear her. Before long, Emily can't bear it anymore. I can't go on, she says. It goes too fast. We don't have time to even look at one another. And then she departs the land of the living. And she exclaims, Oh, earth, you are too wonderful for anybody to realize you. Do human beings ever realize life 
while they live it, every, every minute. You see, when we live in the future, it's so easy for us to miss what God has that's right in front of us. What wisdom cries out is important. We're always out here. We're always in the next thing. We're worried about what's coming down the pike. And one of the beautiful things that this story illustrates is that God has amazing things for us to experience right now in the car ride home tonight before you fall asleep on your pillow, in the conversations you have in the morning with the people that God has put right next to you, the lady in the line at the church waiting for a free meal. All those moments exist, and that, brothers and sisters, is where you will find God powerfully at work all around you. And so tonight I invite you to place your stone in accordance with the cornerstone, to turn to him, to trust in him, to give up your worry, and exchange it for wisdom from God through, par- through prayer. And for all of us t- to make that reference point. Not, I'll go do this and this will work out and everything will be fine. Rather, if the Lord wills, he will let us live and we will do such and such. Amen.